So we start with our bottom superconducting electrode that's on top of that our barrier material, so this could be an insulator. On top of that we have some isolating material, so this could be something like silicon oxide and we cut a hole in it so we can get access to the barrier and then finally we go back to the top superconducting electrode. So this is our final structure and the current goes vertically through the structure and this is our Josephson junction in the centre here. The way to make these junctions where the current flows perpendicular to the, the multi-layer that we've grown as a thin film. Um, but this, as you can see, is made up of several different layers, several different stages of processing. So actually what we want to do is forget this whole complicated top layer. We want some barrier material and then we want some more superconductor. So what we do is we start with that structure. We don't start with half the structure, we start with the final structure. Um, and using the focused iron beam, which is uh, a machine which accelerates gallium ions and focuses them to a very small spot, what we can do is we can remove material three-dimensionally. So as we look in at our filming cross-section, we can actually cut holes through the material um, in this plan view. So we can remove material here. So we can remove that section. And we can remove material here and we remove that section. That's our final junction structure, and this is the crucial area where the current is flowing vertically from the superconductor through the junction and back into the superconducting electrode. Important thing about this type of fabrication method is that we can use any type of structure, so we grow our thin film and then we pattern it with the focused iron beam. So we can grow any type of thin film, we don't have to rely on specific techniques or complicated processing in the clean room. We pattern it and within a day we can have devices that are working. For research purposes we don't want to make 10,000 junctions at the same time. We want to make one device to prototype materials to investigate new types of structures, new types of architectures. And then we can slide the magnetic solenoid over the top. So now we're applying an in-plane field in this direction. Um, let's lower it in. So we're seeing that because of current we're starting at a, a, a large negative field and with signal current coming up, being suppressed, so that's coming up again. pretty much to zero, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And we see another maximum and another minimum. And now we're getting closer to zero field. So this is where we should expect the global maximum of the critical current. glitch there. Okay, so that's and the now it's coming back down. Yeah. And this should, hopefully, be, be absolutely symmetric about zero field. And we should see just the pattern repeating itself on the positive field. So this is a sign that it's a nice uniform junction. The coherence length in the C-axis direction merely an angstrom or so. So, to build uh, artificially the junction, we need to control the fabrication procedure at the atomic scale. This is not impossible. Uh, there is a continuous progress in this. Uh, we can, uh, people manage to grow by molecular beam epitaxia, uh, very nice uh, structures. But, this already exists in, in a single crystal. This is a unique origin of truly SIS superconductor, insulator superconductor, uh, all high DC junctions. This one's 2212 is 15.5 angstrom, meaning that there are 645 junctions per micrometer of width of the bulk crystal. But at present, we observed both the flux quantization, the Fraunhofer pattern of the critical current. We observed the main fingerprints of the AC Jolson effect, Shapira, and Fisky steps. Where do these SIS junctions can be used? Well, first of all, this can be a building block for electronics. Jolson volt standard, uh, flux flow oscillators. SIS tunnel junctions, uh, intrinsic junctions, is so far once again a unique tool to probe the density of states in the bulk of the superconductor. 